says leaders of Rwanda and the DR Congo have agreed on steps to de-escalate after alarm over a surge in violence. U.S. Director of National Intelligence Avery Haines traveled to the two countries on Sunday and Monday and said the United States would monitor their efforts. Kinshasa accuses the M23 rebels, who are primarily Tutsis, of enjoying support from Rwanda, a claim publicly backed by the United States. Father Jean-Claude Atusamiso is the CEO and president of Congo Minerals USA. He tells viewers Douglas Umpuga that he doubts whether the two leaders agree on how to end the conflict. The problem for me is uh, the U.S. know what's going on in the Congo. They know that Rwanda invaded Congo. And uh, they know that they have their soldiers in the Rwanda site, and they have their business people in the Rwanda site. They know how they benefit from what Rwanda is doing. Congolese are not children. Congolese know what's going on. We want them to take those soldiers out of Congo. That's it. And the President uh, Felix is clear on that. We, all of us, we know. We have been seeing how things are going. Do you think there's a chance that the two countries, the two leaders, uh, President Shishikedi and President Kagame, can sit down and solve that problem? It will never happen. So what do you think should be the solution then? The President Kagame must take all those Rwandese he's saying, sending every day in Congo to bring them back in Rwanda, according to the U.S. and according to the President Kagame. It's the Congolese who are in the rebellion who are fighting. Why, when they are dying, they are going to bury them in Rwanda? If they were Congolese, why they are they are bringing them back to Rwanda when they die? So, as uh, Diara Congo heads for elections uh, next month, and there's still tensions in the eastern part of the country, uh, what does that mean for the election? So, you know, the Congolese soldiers are fighting, and they are taking a lot of uh, areas in the eastern Congo. They are fighting, and they are taking a lot of proportion of the, in the eastern Congo. And we believe that on the day of election. All the Congo going to be taken back by the Congolese soldiers on the day of election. We believe that. They have agreed now to let the UN peacekeepers leave. What's your comment on that? No, but uh, that's, uh, th- those, key, those are UN, UN peacekeepers have been stealing, marveling natural resources, cotton, gold, all those natural resources. Enough is enough. The Congolese have their own army now. Let the Congolese fight for themselves. Because these people went there for another game and for another reason, not to, to, to protect the Congolese people. Father Jean-Claude Atusamiso is the CEO and president of Congo Minerals USA. He spoke with my colleague Douglas Mpunga from the state of Virginia, USA. The chair of Liberia's Elections Commission says she's pleased with the way that the commission conducted the first round of the presidential vote on October 10 and the runoff on November 14, despite some challenges. This after the commission on Monday officially declared former Vice President Joseph Boakai the winner of the November 4 runoff election. Cheerleader David Etta Brown Lansana tells me that she is planning ways to strengthen the commission to better carry out its mandate of conducting free, fair, and credible elections, including securing early funding. I think the process was uh, good, despite funding delays, despite the fact that uh, we had challenges on a few with respect to the rough terrain, despite pockets of agitation here and there, and all this hate speech and you know criticisms of whether we were going to deliver or not. But you know, at the end of the day, we say that, uh, as we have said before, that the votes that Liberians put in the ballot box are the votes that we will count, we will tally, we will collate, and then we we'll announce to the Liberian people. And this is what the National Elections Commission has just done. You know, in the October 10 as well as the 14 November runoff uh, presidential election. Madam, looking back, what do you think worked and what didn't work? What worked well, um, I would say, uh, firstly, we have expert staff with capacity to run elections administration, including all of the technical things that we needed to do. You are aware that we transitioned from optical mark recognition which is uh, basically a manual process to biometric voter registration uh, using biometric technology, you know, on printed cards. 
which were distributed to the 2.4 plus million registrants. So this is a big plus for the commission. With respect to challenges, we say that perhaps maybe lesson learned would be that we will at this time continue to plan and advocate for early funding to the National Elections Commission. And we're looking at uh, some legislation that will actually enforce having an escrow account for the commission so that we don't wait until 24 months for the elections, then we're running behind the funding, considering that at times there are economic challenges, even the very government that is responsible to provide these fundings uh, usually go through. So early planning can be of great help to ensuring that uh, funding is available. There are other things, but, you know, there's just too many. Is your term over now? If you are continuing to serve, what do you want to change next? Okay, you know, the position is an appointed position, but by law, it's a tenure position. And I've gone three years already this year. So it's left four more years. And uh, in tenure, it means that um, if the law is respected, it means that I can go another four years. If the politics overtakes the law, then, of course, it means that I chart a new course uh, in another direction. But we continue to remain at the commission, and we're focusing now on how to strengthen the commission in its discharge of its mandate, that is, uh, to conduct free, fair, inclusive, and credible elections. We have several proposals that we think can help to strengthen the commission, something to the effect that we're looking at how we can address the overcrowdedness at uh, polling places. We're also looking at strengthening the CVE strategies and, you know, the electoral reform processes. David Etta Brown Lansana is the chair of National Elections Commission of Liberia. She was speaking with us from the Liberian capital, Monrovia. Chad accommodates over 1 million refugees, constituting one of Africa's largest and rapidly growing refugee populations. Ongoing conflict in neighboring Sudan has propelled hundreds of thousands across the border, exacerbating humanitarian needs while resources to address them are diminishing. Sudanese refugees' numbers in Chad have doubled in the last six months. Paralleling the total arrivals over the past two decades since the Darfur crisis in 2003, the refugee influx, particularly from the recent surge near Darfur's border, intensifies tensions between host communities and newcomers in a country grappling with multiple crises. Chad confronts acute food insecurity and malnutrition, especially among children, worsened by climate changes, economic pressures, declining agriculture, and intercommunal tensions. The refugee crisis further strains food insecure communities, with 2.1 million people facing acute food insecurity in 2023. Chad experiences its worst loan season in a decade, notably in the East since the Sudan crisis. Multinutrition affects 1.36 million children and 8.6% under 5 suffering and 1.5% severely malnourished, particularly concerning in refugee sites. Emergency food security assessment in Eastern Chad reveals poor or borderline food consumption in 90% of new refugees. 77% of pre-existing refugees and 67% of local communities. The World Food Program, WFP, aims to aid 2.85 million people, including refugees. IDPS and vulnerable locals through emergency interventions, school feeding, and malnutrition prevention and treatment, including food and cash-based assistance for sudden onset emergencies like floods. <laughs> 